Okay, uh, this screencast is going to be about the basics of spectrophotometry um, because we will be building spectrophotometers pretty soon. Uh, okay, so I just want to start with some of the basics of light, which uh, you should be pretty familiar with. Uh, I've already drawn on this, and light is a bit confusing because it is both a particle and a wave. I don't understand it fully. I don't think anybody really does. But as a wave, it has a wavelength. So, which is basically the peak-to-peak -peak distance between its oscillations. And with that wavelength, we're able to break light down into uh, several categories. So we have, might have radio waves that have 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 6 meter wavelengths, or really long wavelengths, microwaves, radar waves, infrared, UV, X-rays, gamma rays that make the Hulk. Um, where we lie with our vision is right here between UV and infrared. So we've got this tiny little sliver of light. Fortunately, that leads to a great amount of variety in the world, and it's beautiful, and I'm very glad we have that sliver of light. Uh, the reason that we do, the reason that our eyes are tuned to this range right here between 400 and 700 nanometers, where 700 is around red, 400 is getting kind of violet, is because of black body radiation, which uh, you'll learn about in the future, but Basically, everything that has a temperature emits light. The lower the temperature, the longer the wavelengths of light it emits. So that's why you know infrared cameras can see like body temperature. But the sun, being much hotter than your body, one would hope, uh, ends up giving out light in this range between 400 and 700 nanometers. So the sun being 5,000. Da. Okay, the sun being 5,505 degrees C ends up putting out visible light, and so our eyes are tuned to that. So a couple other basic properties of light. We already talked about wavelength. Well, that's wavelength. It also has some velocity, which is a fundamental property of the universe, we believe. So uh, in a vacuum, light moves very quickly. That's the technical term. It goes uh, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. 186,000 miles per second, so very, very fast. And <clears throat> because it has a velocity and a wavelength, we can calculate its frequency. So this is basically how quickly it goes from peak to peak. So that is basically the velocity divided by the uh, wavelength. So it's in units of 1 over time seconds there. It also has an energy, which is Planck's constant, which is shown right here multiplied by the velocity of, of the light, divided by the uh, wavelength of the light. So if we were to look at these two uh, photons traveling, and we were to try to decide which photon has the greatest amount of energy, because it is inversely proportional to the wavelength, this one has the longest wavelength, so that means it's divided by that long wavelength, whereas this one's divided by a short wavelength, and this one should have the most energy, and indeed it does. Let's calculate the uh, the energy of a blue photon, just to give you an example, at 475 nanometers. So just use this equation right here. Energy equals Planck constant times speed of light divided by the uh, <coughs> wavelength, and we get a very small amount of energy, 4.18 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, which is nearly nothing. It would take, <laughs> I'm not even going to say it, it would take that many blue photons to equal the caloric content of a grain of sugar. So, not a lot. But fortunately, we're always working, well, typically we're working with a great number of photons. So, <clears throat> we talked about the speed of light in a vacuum. And light does indeed have speed in a vacuum, and that is the maximum speed of the universe. That is our speed limit. However, it goes at different speeds within different media. So it goes in different speed within glass, then it does in water, and then it does in vacuum, of course, because this is the maximum. These two must be lower, and we typically uh, report the speed of light in different media as an index of refraction, n, which is the speed of light in the vacuum divided by the speed of that light in that material. Typically, not always, the denser the material, the uh, slower the light. So through glass, 
The index of refraction is 1.5 through water 1.33, so it moves much slower in glass than it does in water. But different wavelengths of light have different indexes of refraction. So if we were to look at a prism, a glass prism here, you've all probably seen this, you shine white light through the prism, it gets broken into its constituent wavelengths, so red, orange, yellow, green, broken into the rainbow, and that's because different uh, wavelengths have different indexes of refraction, leading to those different colors. So let's talk about colors for a second. We see them all around us. You are looking at them right now on your uh, computer screen. So we get colors from LEDs and computer screens, lights in the ceiling. We see colors in paint pigments and liquid dyes. <clears throat> so where do these colors come from? Of course, they come from our sensory organs. So looking at these different uh, words, they all have a different color. The light from that goes into our pupil, goes to the lens, it's uh, focused onto our retina, where we see the word color in green, hopefully unless we're colorblind. So all that just depends upon what wavelengths of light make it to our eye. Once they uh, get to our eye, hit our retina, they're either absorbed by rods, which detect either light or darkness, or cones, which are sensitive to specific colors. So they could be specific to red, blue, green. So red and green would give us yellow. If green and blue are triggered, it might give us cyan. If red and blue are triggered, it might give us a violet or a magenta. So with those three, we get all we need. Um, so there are a couple different types of uh, light that could end up resulting in color in this, these three examples where the eye is getting the color purple. So with radiative light, it just depends upon the wavelength that the radiation source puts out. So here we have our red light and blue light turned on, red and blue wavelengths. We end up thinking we see purple, which uh, is what we do in our mind. Uh, but there's also things like paint pigments and dyes and liquids. So if we have white light, so as all the wavelengths hits the surface of uh, the painting, only the uh, green pigment is picked up and absorbed into the painting. What's reflected is red and blue. Again, we see purple. Transmitted light, so we have white light, goes through a liquid that has some dye in it, absorbs the green light, out comes red and blue. Again, see purple in each case. So it just depends upon what light hits our eye. Our eye, in this case, is the sensor, the detector. So why does this happen? Why do some wavelengths get picked up and others just uh, pass on by harmlessly? That's because if we look at the molecules that make up pigments and surfaces and stuff like that, you know, we've got our atoms, they're connected to other atoms through molecular bonds. And uh, we have our electrons, and they can go bounce up to higher orbitals, but these must be discrete orbitals. They can't go midway between these two points. They need a very a discrete amount of energy to make them do that. And if we send a photon in there that has that energy, so if it has the right wavelength, then it's going to bounce that electron up and absorb that photon. So in this case, we've absorbed green, red, and blue makes it through. Of course, the other thing can happen where we have an electron at a high orbital and it can fall down to a lower orbital and in doing so eject a photon. So in this case it's eject a photon with the wavelength that uh, is associated with that energy drop between these two orbitals. So now if that is all it did was absorb green and then transmit green we wouldn't really see color because we have no net gain in green or blue or red. Some molecules can absorb you know, one wavelength and end up transmitting another uh, through their pi orbitals. It, it gets complicated and we're not going to get into that, but if you notice around you, of course, there are molecules giving off many different colors of light, even though you've got white light probably in your ceiling or from the sun. And you'll notice a lot of these molecules have you know, double bonds, resonance structures that's important to uh, creating the, the uh, 
the instances where you can absorb one particular wavelength of light preferentially. Just so you know, what we'll be working with is malachite green, which is right here. Puts off this nice cyan. But let's take a closer look at you know how we uh, use these these colors of molecules to do spectrophotometry. So different molecules might have different colors to our eye. They also have different spectra, and that's where the colors come from. So if we were to look at the wavelength of light that we sent into a certain molecule, and then we looked at the wavelength we got out, the percentage of it that that, that we got out, uh, some of that would be absorbed. So where, so like for this malachite green, some of the purples absorbed, and then also some a great deal of the yellows and oranges and reds are absorbed. So what we end up seeing is what is not absorbed. So this area here, this this uh, blue green area. Whereas if we were to look at a different molecule like beta carotene, a lot of the uh, purples and blues and some of the greens are absorbed. Not a lot of the orange, yellow, red. None of those are absorbed, so we end up getting nice beta carotene color in our carrots. So what's the basic idea behind uh, spectrophotometry? We want to use the spectrums to tell us something about our samples. Sorry. Okay, so uh, we might have some light source that, it, that puts off certain wave intensities under different wavelengths of light. That will go through, in one case, a blank sample, and then we'll measure what comes out. You know, even with blank samples, it might be going through the walls of cuvette or some glass or something like that, so we're going to lose some intensity. And we also want to compare that to that same light going through our sample and then we'll measure the intensity when it comes out. So what's that going to do for us? We're going to end up with two spectrums. What we want to know is what changed between these two. By how much did it change and, and what does that tell us about our sample? And we'll get into the theory about that later on, but as you can see just in this little illustration, we've lost a peak here, lost another peak here. So if we were to take those two spectra and compare them together, we can see that you know there's some information contained within that loss in that loss right there. So we will get to that. But so just a basic spectrophotometer, how it works. So we've got a light source. That light source puts off certain intensities of light at different wavelengths. We might have a red light source, blue, green, might have white, so it's a broad spectrum. You know, could be like that. But it's typically adjustable. So we can you know, move that light source one way or the other, look at different wavelengths. We also have some sort of sample stage through which light may travel. So in that sample stage, in this case we have a little cuvette which has our liquid sample in it, and that, you know, so in this case is beta carotene, has some spectrum, and <clears throat> so that's where that sample would absorb light. Then we also have our sensor that detects light. This could be very broad or it could be very narrow. We could maybe maybe it's adjustable. We can use two different sensors for different wavelengths. But it does have some, you know, preference for absorbing certain wavelengths of light. Now this case I've shown here where we've got all these distributions separated, this is not an ideal case because we want to send light into the sample that is going to be absorbed by the sample. So in this case we'd want to move our light over to where our sample best absorbs. So if I were to uh, move that over and, and change from a uh, red light to a blue light, all of a sudden I've got all this area to which I'm sensitive. I'm going to be detecting our, our chemical being absorbed in that area. Now before we get to the theory, let me mention that spectrophotometry comes in multiple flavors. So you might have an FTIR, so a Fourier Transform Infrared Spectrophotometer. This measures bond vibrations, rotations, bond stretching. Uh, great for determining what kind of bonds are in your substance. But it looks in the infrared, so 0.8 microns to 1,000 micron wavelength. UV vis, you're going to be building the visible part of this, basically. So this is ultraviolet invisible. It looks at electron transitions in molecules, 200 to 800 nanometers typically. We've got one right here. Flame AA, atomic absorption. So this basically looks at uh, electron transitions in single atoms. These have to be 
excited atoms. And it's very precise, so a very narrow range of absor atomic absorption lines, so you can detect like lead in, in water. Um, then you'll find spectrometry everywhere, basically. So like in uh, chr chr chrom chromatographers, like this HPLC here, basically the detector is a simple spectrophotometer. So with that, I'm going to get into theory in the uh, next screencast, and uh, I'll end this one here.